Aloha, this is uh, Richard Ha. I'm going to be your host today on uh, Inventing Our Future. The subject is hydrogen. And uh, our guest is Dr. Uh, Michael Ginsberg. Michael, and then just let's talk about who you are, and then we'll get right into it. Uh, talk about uh, hydrogen the way you would you feel comfortable, and then we go from there. Great. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Nice to be with you uh, again. And my name is Michael Ginsberg. I have been working in the renewable energy industry for about 15 years. Uh, and I did my PhD in, in green hydrogen. Um, and then for the last couple of years, I've worked in uh, developing green hydrogen plants uh, around the, the U.S. Uh, so happy to talk to you about the, the production of hydrogen and also the, the use of hydrogen. Okay. Um, you know what I'm really, uh, a lot of people are curious about is there's all these different colors of hydrogen. Green, blue, polka dot. Um, maybe you can <laughs> help us with that. <laughs> yeah, there's this like hydrogen color wheel, but the, but they're yeah they're not actually colored. Uh, the the hydrogen itself, it the the colors refer to how much carbon is associated with that hydrogen. So what is the car, car, carbon footprint uh, of that of that uh, of that hydrogen and when you call when you, you probably heard of gray hydrogen, that's that's uh, when you when you make it from natural gas, you take a methane molecule and you burn it basically and and produce CO two and 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 H two and and that's the hydrogen. So when we say green hydrogen, uh, we make it by um, by splitting water in in a process called electrolysis, and then we we have as low as a zero carbon intensity. Uh, there's also pink. Pink is uh, referring to the uh, production of hydrogen from nuclear energy. Okay. Um, and then you also have blue. So blue is the same thing as, as gray, but you, cap you capture the carbon. So they, I don't really know why they call it blue, but it's considered to have a, a similarly low carbon intensity as green hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting. Oh. Uh, you know, another thing that's on people's minds is is the safety of hydrogen. The first thing they think is just going to blow up. Um, you know, and the Indiburg comes to mind. And I don't really think it was the hydrogen, but maybe you can explain the, about the safety and how fast it moves and and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I think that that definitely always comes to mind for folks. And I talk to everyone from the fire departments and local local communities as a developer these days to um you know to, to really uh to really anyone and so the, the hydrogen itself is certainly a flammable flammable gas um it, it has a it's called a flammability range between four and 75 percent in air that's pretty wide compared to other fuels um so under sort of an optimal combustion condition the energy that's required to initiate hydrogen combustion um, is much lower than that required for other fuels. So, for example, a small a small spark will ignite it. Uh, so we have what's called the lower explosive limit. So the amount of hydrogen that's in the air and needs to be below a certain amount so that it's you know that it doesn't ignite. But in you know in in the in the practice of using the hydrogen, engineering systems are designed to prevent you know a, a lot a lot of hydrogen from being released. Um, the other thing that's that's different is that it you know burns with a a pale blue flame that's that's difficult to see in the daylight. So it's very it's pretty impossible to detect by human by human eyes. So it, it needs to be you know sense it needs to be a sense and and and, and add, we need to add odorants to to that to that fuel, which is similar to what we all already do with natural gas. Uh, we add odorants. So we need we need hydrogen um, and flame detectors. Um, when, whenever you have hydrogen systems, um, the, the other, the other thing that I'd mention is that, you know, when, when we use hydrogen in, in vehicles, which will probably be the, you know, the most common use for, for everyday folks is, uh, it's compressed to a very high level, very high pressure. So, so, um, when it's compressed, it, you know, it, there's, there's more fl flammability concern. There's more, uh, safety, safety concern there at, at, at high pressure. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you know, um, I was over at Hank Rogers' place, and they were demonstrating the use of hydrogen, like in a hydrogen burner. You know, and it looks like a, a regular stove, you know, a propane stove. But, you know, when you put your hand up close to the flame from the side, you don't feel it until you're kind of almost on top of it. Well, why, why is that? Yeah, um, so it's, it's really about the, um, the temperature of the flame, but, but more so that the fact that hydrogen uh, is, is, uh, is the very light molecule, so it, it, goes, it goes actually vertically up. The propagation is vertical rather than, than lateral, we call it. So you're not going to feel it more from the sign, but you'll, you'll feel it more from directly above. Um, that, that hydrogen gas goes straight up. Man. <laughs> so so what, what, what is the, the practical implication of, of that? Because propane, you can feel the, the heat from, from the sides everywhere, yeah? So, and so you can imagine that uh, that's what we're used to. But now when the yeah. heat goes straight up, um, is there anything that the average person would kind of need to kind of uh, get in their minds about how this thing works? Yeah, I, I mean, because hydrogen, you know, in addition to being vertically propagating, is also um, emitting very little infrared heat, which you can sense. It's more more in the ultraviolet range. Um, again, the there's there's a, a a need for there to be sensors in in any in any hydrogen you know systems, uh, as as well as like a, like I mentioned the this odor and so uh, it does it does represent a different kind of um, you know, different kind of risks for folks. Um, so, you know, fl flames, flames are, are a little harder to sense for that reason. Like you, like you noticed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and you mentioned that it, it rises quite fast compared to, uh, so it doesn't sink down to the ground and then starts building up and then get to the flame right. and blow itself up. Right. Exactly. Uh, and yeah, so what so do people do to, to, to make sure it's safer? knowing that that's a characteristic. Yeah. So in, in a facility where you um, either produce the hydrogen or use it, you know, fill where you're using it to fill a vehicle, for instance, which I think uh, is going to be the most common use for everyday, everyday people is um, you'll often have, uh, I, I noticed this working on a project in California, you'll have a, um, a blast, about a blast wall, essentially that's rated for, uh, any kind of um, uh, incident that could happen with the with with the hydrogen in terms of uh, any kind of explosion or uh, f a flame, and you have to separate you know people from uh, from uh, f f from that potential uh, from occurring, and um, so those controls have to be in place. And I think in addition to that, you, you know you have to have minimum safety distances between um, you know people and uh, uh, and 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 the hydrogen. In addition, you know, when you, if you're using hydrogen, you know, to, for your car, for instance, it's going to be, it's going to be stored in, you know, tanks and it's going to be, you know, there's gonna, you're not going to have um, any direct exposure um, to, to it, uh, you know, and then if there is potentially, then there's going to be some sort of sensor or uh, alert that comes on that's going to shut down the system. Uh, so we really do have to rely on these, you know, on these uh, engineer, engineering, um, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, engineering and, you know, mechanisms to prevent, to prevent uh, uh, folks from being exposed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and talking about vehicles, um, if, if you can figure out a way for it to escape, then you don't have a, much of a problem. Yeah, this could be compared to uh, gasoline or uh, stuff like that. Is, is, is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, like in, in, in hydrogen systems, they're, they're regulated in such a way that you have to have, you know, hydrogen gas leak detectors, um, you know, in, in any, in, either in a pipe that's, that's, that's uh, you know, where, the, where, the, where the hydrogen is, is being transferred to your vehicle or in the, ve the vehicle itself um, and, and ensuring that what, whatever quantity that you have is, is lower again than that, than that lower explosive, um, that ex lower explosive limit. But, but yeah, I mean that's why there's there's still a good deal of um you know change that has to happen with um, understanding how how hydrogen works as a molecule. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, dealing with, you know, different communities, we, we, we have um, a responsibility to develop what's called a safety plan for both um, the fire department and for, and for people that are, that are using it. But I, you know, I want to say that it's, you know, hydrogen has been around for quite a, a long, a long time, you know, as a commercial uh, fuel. And so, you know, it, it's not that it um, is anything really new. It's just, it's just uh, um, now we're, we're talking about getting it more, you know, out there a little bit more into, um, to local communities that are not as used to it. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, natural gas propane still, of course, all also have, have their, their own risk um, as, as well. It's just that, that, that flammability range is much wider. Um, <laughs> yeah. You were saying you're working with people with doing green hydrogen. What, what are the different ways people uh, make green hydrogen? What, 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 different processes out there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when, uh, so when we talk about green hydrogen, we primarily are talking about water splitting. Um, and that's the, the electrolysis process of, you know, just taking that H2O and putting in an electric, uh, electric current and um, in a membrane, splitting the hydrogen from the oxygen. Um, we call it an le- electrocatalytic process because the we use certain metals that um, that separate those uh, um, those molecules. So it's uh, it's called green because there's no carbon dioxide emitted. There's no there's no emissions. Only only thing that's generated is is oxygen aside from from the hydrogen. And the oxygen could also be valuable. Um, you know, it could be it could be sold. It could be used for a number of things. So yeah, I mean, aside from from electrolysis, um, there are some some other technologies that. That could be considered green. There's something called methane pyrolysis, where instead of um, burning natural gas, what we call steam methane re- reformation, we end up with a uh, solid carbon, as well as as well as the um, um, as well as the hydrogen. So so instead of the sort of gaseous carbon that's problematic for our for our for our atmosphere, you end up with a solid carbon that could be useful, um, you know, in in other products. Yeah, it's so that. You end up taking the carbon out of the carbon dioxide out of the air. That's basically is that what you just said? So actually, in the methane pyrolysis, you you never go into that gaseous state, but you end up with a with a solid a solid carbon. Um, oh, not a not a carbon dioxide. Mm-hmm. I I got you. So something like biochar or something like that is that what? biochar? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And there are other other good other products that come out of that using pyrolysis. Um, no, you, you, you still, you know, you still end up with the, with hydrogen and then, and then carbon there. Um, yeah. Well, okay. Uh, and, and in some instances they try to sequester the carbon underground. Is that part of the? Yeah. So that's more in the, you know, the steam methane reformation process, typical, typical process where you'll just capture the carbon. Um, so we, we call that about, we call that the blue, the blue hydrogen. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, it's just the, yeah, direct air capture and 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 sequestration. And you've been working with um, is is a lot of lot of folks doing green hydrogen, a lot of projects around the world. Yeah, we're we're definitely seeing a big a big surge. Um, so you know, there's probably a, a five times increase that that's occurring right now over the next couple of years. Right now, there's very little install green hydrogen. Um, right, right now, it's primarily from that burning of natural gas, but we're trying to replace all of that existing hydrogen that's currently used. And most of it's just used for things that most people don't really see, like um, you know, it's used actually in refining of petroleum. Hydrogen is also used in chemical, you know, pr- uh, chemical production. It's used for um, ammonia, so fertilizer. Um, so yeah, I mean, most folks don't really see hydrogen and how it's used, but, but it actually is a big part of our society today. What we're talking about, I think going into the future is using the hydrogen uh, for transportation and, and increasingly using it for what's called sustainable aviation fuel. So, um, you know, instead of using the traditional jet fuel, which is very carbon intensive, we're, we're replacing that with 
either some sort of ethanol based or um, you know some sort of hi hi hydrogen input into a process that makes um, that makes the same quality jet fuel but but doesn't have as much carbon associated. So that that's a really promising area for for hydrogen as well. Mm -hmm. And on how far out into the future are they looking at uh, actually getting this into uh, part of commercial aviation? Yeah, so uh, we've been working pretty pretty heavily on this over the last year. And um, if you look today, actually, on your phone, if you book a flight, you know it'll say if you want to, you could pay a little bit to offset your your flight. What that means is the airline, let's say American or United, whomever, is is actually um, buying more sustainable aviation fuel. So it, there's a market there, and it currently exists. Um, primarily, it's all ethanol uh, based, so corn based. Um, but but yeah, there, there's other there's other forms of of uh, of, of, of a sustainable aviation fuel that are coming that are coming online. Ah, oh, yeah. You know, it just occurred to me. But uh, what if we could make green hydrogen here in Hawaii? Would we be able to? We probably could use it, yeah, to to refuel those oh, yeah. headliners that are, are. And what about ocean transportation? Yeah, I mean that's another one. Um, using using the hydrogen for, for as a fuel for uh, for for tankers. Um, there's some there's some projects that are starting in California that are that are actually hydrogen hydrogen powered uh, uh, cruise ships and um, hydrogen powered uh, tanker tankers. So that's that's definitely coming out coming out. Um, there's some small modifications that have to be made to the to the engines and you know the 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 tanks on the on board the ships. Um, but there there's something that the International Maritime Organization is actually going to start requiring that that um, that ships have to use some sort of green fuel uh, wow. over the next five years. Uh, so you're you're going to see that for sure, and I think in addition to the maritime, you'll I think um, you know in in Hawaii, uh, the fer fertilizer industry um, would would be another big one. Yeah, I got good care to be listening to you. I forgot. Oh, no, no, it's, sorry. Is there anything? Well, tell me what what yeah. got you into this field? How did you get involved? How what what made you want to do what you're doing? Yeah. So, you know, I worked for, I worked in renewable energy and basically solar and wind for a long time. And then I, I actually started my PhD research in what's called perovskite solar cells, which are more sort of more efficient, lower cost solar. But what I realized was the more solar and wind that we get, the more that we, we have to solve for the problem of the variability or intermittency. So I, I see hydrogen uh, as, as well as a, way of storing that 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 uh renewable power and then using it when we need it um so you could take the renewables you know through electrolysis convert it into hydrogen and then use the hydrogen and either directly or convert it back to electricity through a fuel cell so it's basically another form of a battery and it lasts for months versus versus hours like like electric electrochemical batteries so that's what i got that's why i got into it in my my research was all about modeling uh, of uh, the, you know, simulating basically, you know, how do we how do we take advantage of that that solar and and wind power? Yeah, and and you know, uh, how young were you when you kind of ha had this idea of getting into science the way you you ended up in? Yeah, well, um, I've always loved science, and I grew up watching uh, Star Trek. You know, and so it piqued my interest from a young age. But I think maybe in my in my early twenties, um, I started to realize that there were a lot of problems, you know, in our in our world. And I, I really got very passionate about figuring out ways for us to to live more more sustainably on the planet, which is you know what why 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 I was I was working with Yame and Brittany, and but basically you know the uh, uh, very, very driven, and and um, I felt like doing the PhD would would get me to a place where I could make a meaningful contribution to 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 knowledge and to and to, and to helping our society. So, yeah, I, I've I've kind of dabbled in a lot of different areas within energy, um, trying to figure out how, how do we how do we how do we get to to a good place on the planet, and and also advance ourselves 
you know, we, we shouldn't be in a place where we're, we're in need of, of energy or where we're, where we're being, we're burning fossil fuels, you know, burning fossil fuels is actually a pretty inefficient process. If you think about it, you're, you're taking the sun's energy from millions of years ago and, and there's very little energy within that, within those fossils. So let's try to just harness the sun's power directly. Yeah. Oh, interesting. You know, recently I've um, noticed Toyota talking about hydrogen, but not so much the fuel cell, uh, mm. as much as uh, internal combustion engine. And that really got my attention. Have you worked anywhere in that space or what, what, what can you say about that? What, what is. Yeah. So primarily we, we've been, you know, look, working with, um, companies like Toyota but uh, around the fuel cell vehicles, uh, I have heard about this interest in, in the ice or the internal combustion engine with hydrogen. Um, the only thing about that is you're still going to have some oxide emissions um, because, you know, NOx, specifically nitrogen oxide, you, you get some um, saw that forming, which, which is, which is an, a considered a pollutant. Mm. Um, so I don't really lo love that, but, mm. but yeah, I know, I know other, there, there's, um, a benefit to, to the to the direct combustion of hydrogen because when when you when you convert from from a hydrogen to electrical power in a fuel cell you do lose you know a good amount of that energy um so, so you know and then you could use potentially existing trucks and retrofit them for the hydrogen right um with with the ice with the ice engine you know, i i had no idea that it, it ends up with um nitrogen oxide in the ice engines yeah mm -hmm. that's interesting yeah just because of the way that you know there's the nitrogen in the air reacting with the oxygen that that's you know yeah um yeah um what uh what would you like to um tell the audience about hydrogen what is the most important thing on your mind to, to get people to understand that they might not understand we have a different conception of hydrogen. Yeah, I think that there is definitely a role for hydrogen um, in the, we call the energy transition. The, I think hi hydrogen, but we talked about early, people are a little bit concerned about the safety. And I, I think that pe people should, should know that there's, there's quite a bit of, of, of regulation um, and, and, and design to make sure that, that hydrogen handling and transportation uh, is, is, is very well regulated. Um, there's something like 30 different you know, re regulations around, um, around how, how hydrogen is allowed to be used. Um, and there's a long history of its use, everything from within NASA with rockets to ammonia to you know petrochemical industry. So uh, as a society, we've used hydrogen for quite a long time. I, I think that the, the opportunity now um, is, um, you know, for for us to use it in the new in new sectors like transportation. Um, you know, and you know, if you're listening to this and uh, and uh, you know, you're either in in local government or perhaps um, perhaps you're you know you're you're you're, uh, you're just thinking about buying a fuel cell car. Uh, I just encourage you to, you know, th think about um, what what are the how how can we help support the, the this this important industry, uh, whether that be, um, you know, um, making it easier to permit uh, the the you know fueling stations. Uh, how do we incentivize you know um, more of these vehicles in our in our communities? So, um, especially I suppose for like lo local governments, it, it's important to think that th this is a big sh shift. And if, if we don't do something, you know, if we don't express the interest, it's going to be hard to get, you know, the, the, the private, the private sector dollars. And so as a developer and having worked as a developer, I think there's, there's a lot of value in having a community that that's supportive of, you know, of, of the, of these kinds of projects. Uh you, you know, I, 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 we've got five volcanoes on this island, you know, and uh, we're sitting on this hot spot that's going to last for a million years. And because we're sitting on an island, there's water on, 
uh, with heat underneath because of the volcano. And the heat rises as steam and can spin, spin a turbine. And it can last for a million years. And then, of course, you got to change the pipes and stuff like that. But the energy press is going to last for a million years, which basically tells me that we're going to have a competitive advantage to the rest of the world because we have that. But there's no, we don't have to do anything except spin the turbine. Now, um, because of, 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 you know, where we are in, in the energy space where we have this conflict, you know, in uh, 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 Ukraine and, and, uh, and we're fighting over energy, essentially that's what we're doing. So what, what I'm thinking is there's not the direct connection in most people's minds that we have geothermal and we can make green hydrogen. Because we could we talk about geothermal, that's one thing. But if we can make green hydrogen with geothermal and last little, a million years. How, how urgently would you would you uh, encourage us to move forward with making this green hydrogen? What 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 is your thoughts about that? Yeah, well, the thing about it is, you know, electric electric energy can only go so far. So if you're, I mean, geothermal is great, but if you're, you know, if you're spinning a turbine making electricity that way. You can't, it's not, yeah, everybody knows it's not so easy to electrify heating, right? So, uh, and and whether that be, you know, residential or commercial or industrial, the first step is, you know, industrial heating, but uh, you're going to need both. So you need you need a fuel, in my opinion, a molecule, and you need electrical energy. So having those two together would be a big, a big um, asset to, to Hawaii. And I think it would make Hawaii incre increasingly sustainable as well as self-sufficient um, for all its energy needs. Yeah, because we're sitting out here in the middle of the Pacific. <laughs> yeah. We have to get it. Exactly. But, you know, so the fact that we have the geothermal spins and we make, make electricity, the electricity is going to be competitive to other places that make electricity. And that's where our advantage comes over time. Yeah, so if we're looking for future generations, uh, this is a good time to get started to, to, because we could do it on every island, at least test to see if, you know, how much out there can we do? Because that's, it, it's not intermittent like uh, wind and solar. It's a started, you know, steady state. Anyway, I got, I got my... <laughs> I'd love to hear more about your, uh, uh, your ideas there. Yeah, yeah, it, because there's a two-step, you know, you talk about geothermal, you don't get the connection between geothermal and hydrogen, but it's the electricity. It's the cheap electricity right. over time that's the that's the deciding factor. So that and that's the, the 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 that's the most important factor in the cost of hydrogen is the cost of uh, electricity. Yeah. yeah. Oh, terrific! It's, it, was there anything you wanted to say? You know, we are we got a few more minutes, and uh, yeah, but if you wanted to say. Yeah, no, I'm just. Uh, I think I think it's great that um, we we talk we talk about you know hydrogen and would be, you know, would would, would I think it's it's important for, um, you know, folks to to to, to just consider the the ways that we're where we're working to 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 do this energy transition. Um, it's not one 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 you know tool. It's, it's not just solar. It's not just uh, you know, geothermal and and so you know uh, there's a lot of resources online if people want to want to learn more about uh, green hydrogen actually the US Department of Energy has some great tools uh, for folks who work in in energy you can you can check them out um, and yeah I mean there's so many industries that hydrogen can can be used in aside from what we talked about um, you know there's also think about data centers um, I'm not I'm not sure how how big of a of a demand there is in Hawaii, but we you know working with companies like Microsoft or you know those those are huge huge consumers of power and um, you know we we could use hydrogen there as well. Um, so yeah, I, I just yeah I encourage folks to think uh, about how how do we create the conditions necessary for a new sort of hydrogen economy. Um, uh, think about you know moving from the traditional gas station to um, to the, sort of like the the the, the, hi, the hydrogen fueling station, and uh, they're they're similar, but 
uh, uh, from my, my experience, it, it, it definitely takes some time to, you know, to get people comfortable, uh, with, with, with it. And, and hydrogen is, um, um, either a gas or a liquid. And so we, we could, we could transport it in a couple of ways. Um, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, uh, we, th this is so valuable to hear you describe this and, and you know, somebody who actually knows the subject. <laughs> yeah. So thanks a lot, Dr. Michael, um, Ginsburg. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Roger. Always a pleasure. Okay. So in two weeks, we'll be back up with, let's see, we're at hydrogen H. So we'll be talking about I. Not sure what that I will be, we'll deciding. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. See you.